Um, so yeah, today I'm just going to um, kind of go over some research that we've got going on at uh, the Forest Products Laboratory. And uh, so first off, just to introduce myself, my name is Grant Kirker. I'm a Forest Products Research Technologist in Wood Durability and Protection. Um, I've been at the lab about eight years, and uh, my research areas are wood decay fungi and wood protection. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about the lab, uh, FPL was, is located in Madison, Wisconsin, and it was founded in 1911 as the National Research Lab for the study of forest products. And we have about 10 research units there, uh, ranging from paper, engineered wood products, uh, wood durability and protection, and uh, building moisture and fire, and others. Um, I want to acknowledge the uh, other researchers involved in these projects, because I didn't do this by myself. Um, there's, uh, we've got a pretty good team working on this, and uh, just to uh, highlight the uh, FPL researchers that are involved in the research that I'll present later, uh, Juliet Tang is working on the termite resistance of CLT project, uh, Mark Mankowski is working on the field testing and treatments for CLT, uh, Katie Ono is working on coatings for CLT, and I'd also like to acknowledge our university partners, um, Beth Stokes at the uh, Mississippi State Department of Sustainable Bioproducts. She's working on the termite and fungal laboratory testing. Uh, we've got Mojgan Najad, who's now at Michigan State. Um, she's working on the coatings project with Katie. And we've also got Jeff Morrell, who's working with uh, Mark Mankowski and myself on the uh, field testing and treatments. Just to give you kind of a quick overview and uh, I've got a fair amount of slides, so I'm going to go through this first part pretty fast. Um, I just wanted to kind of just touch on a quick review of the main agents of biodeterioration that we're interested in, and especially those that I think would pertain particularly well to CLT. So first off, we're going to talk about fungi. Um, these are microscopic organisms. They have thread-like hyphae, and they produce uh, enzymes that extracellular, extracellularly digest the uh, components of wood. Um, these can be broadly categorized as stained fungi, soft rots, molds, or decay wood fungi. So stained fungi are introduced by bark beetles um, feeding on the living tree. Um, blue stain is pretty common in pine, and I was interested to see one of the manufacturers was actually making kind of a, a denim um, CLT, which I, I really liked. Um, and as far as the treatment um, aspect, uh, the stained fungi typically don't impede with pressure treatment. Uh, they're typically in the parenchyma cells, which doesn't, doesn't really affect uptake. Um, and historically, blue stain wood's been considered defective back in the 80s, but uh, it's, it's kind of making a recurrence now, so I'm really happy to see that. Uh, the next thing I'll talk about are molds. Um, these are basically kind of the weeds of the fungal world. They grow really fast. They're prolific sporulators, and they spread um, through HVAC and just blowing air currents. Um, some of these can be important human allergens, so there's a health concern there. And also you have uh, black molds, uh, certain yeasts that are pretty common on treated wood, and they actually uh, have the ability to break down a lot of um, stains, coatings, and other uh, chemicals that are used to treat wood. Um, so just molds are an aesthetic problem, but they can cause <coughs> allergies. Um, typically mold growth requires uh, about 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 80 to 95 percent ambient relative humidity. And an uh, important thing to mention here is that once wood, wood gets above 20 percent moisture content, it is subject to mold. Um, we're kind of progressing now into the wood degrading fungi. Uh, soft rot fungi are actually ascomycetes. Um, they produce enzymes that impact the secondary cell wall of fungi. It's pretty characteristic. Um, and it, this is a soft rotted piece of uh, a utility pole, and, and it causes kind of the shrunken um, decay pattern at the ground line, and uh, eventually this will kind of start to slough off, and this is like it's turning back into dirt. Uh, the other group that we primarily concerned with are the wood decay fungi. Um, these are the ones that can severely impact wood strength properties. Uh, they're classified as either brown rot or white rot based on their characteristic rot types. Um, and uh, you, you've seen pictures of these. The uh, brown rot is, is basically you have this cubicle rot pattern, which is um, it, it's preferentially degrading the cellulose, leading, leading, leaving behind the uh, blocky, crumbly uh, lignin structure. Uh, these other two examples are just uh, different types of white rot, um, which do the opposite. They break down the lignin 
and partially degrade the cellulose and leave them behind in kind of the stringy pattern that you see here. There. And um, the, we do a lot of work with the American Wood Protection Association, and they're the ones that specify preservative treatments for wood. And they've developed the AWPA hazard map, um, which estimates the decay hazard for a given region. And these are based on uh, average temperature and rainfall. And they use that to set uh, retention levels and uh, to determine different hazards for ground contact decay. Alternatively, you also have the Shepherd Decay Index, which uses the same methods, but those are uh, primarily used in above ground exposures. So those give, you, give us kind of a measure of, based on where you are in the continental US and why, um, how these products will perform in ground contact and above. So that covers fungi. Uh, next, I want to talk about insects. Um, Certain groups of insects just feed directly on the wood. Others excavate it and uh, just make uh, nests and galleries in the wood. Uh, usually moisture is a factor here, so moisture management is always is good. Um, insecticides are often used in wood preserve formulations, which prevent um, controlling insects, termites being a great example. Mm -hmm. And just some examples, termites, carpenter ants, and bees, uh, and there's also numerous types of uh, wood boring beetles that can affect wood. Uh, just to focus on a few here, uh, termites are a serious pest of wood and wood-based materials. Uh, 11 billion on an annual basis is used for treatment. Uh, that's an old number. It's probably gone way up since then. Um, and these can be categorized as either subterranean dry wood or damp wood. Uh, damp woods are more common here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, subterraneans are pretty much widespread in North America. Um, even reaching into parts of Canada, and dry woods are found uh, primarily on the uh, coastal areas. And these distribution maps kind of give you an idea of, of where they're found. And um, we have actually this first map here, uh, this, the subterranean termite zones of North America. Um, you have native termites that are widespread in North America, but also along coastal areas, you have an introduced species, uh, Coptotermius fomosanus, which was introduced in like the 1940s, and uh, it's, a, it's a much more uh, voracious feeder, so it's a, it's a really big concern in those areas. And those are also um, arboreal, so they're tree nesting termites by nature, um, so they can form um, above ground nests that you don't typically see with subterraneans. And uh, this other map just shows dry wood damage, or dry wood termite distributions, which is mostly concentrated around coastal areas. Uh, Say Toronto, has, Toronto has them. Yeah. Well, the, the green nine probably was brought Lake Ontario, not Hamilton. It does. I need to update my map because, yeah, they are, in, they are in Canada. They're right, Canada. So yeah. thanks for paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so part two, I want to cover some uh, current durability standards that are found in, uh, in the standards and codes uh, that pertains to CLT that do address preservative treatment and durability. Uh, the first thing I want to cover is the uh, AWPA Book of Standards. Um, this is kind of our go-to book for pressure treatment and uh, preservative treatment for wood. And within it is the use class category system, which is how they based uh, preservative retentions and concentrations for treated wood. And you're gonna see these mentioned a lot in a lot of these guidance documents for CLT. And I just kind of put down some examples here of the different use classes and where that they would apply in, in a typical CLT construction. Um, UC class two, which is mentioned a lot in the national design standard and CLT specs, um, is an above ground interior that's frequently damp, which is damp is defined as above 20% moisture content. And uh, to me, that's bathrooms and splash zones, spot on. And uh, UC3 would be an above ground exterior. Um, cantilevered exposed decks would be a good example of that, where, where they're, they're wetted but not frequently wetted. Um, and uh, of course, UC4, it's ground contact. There's also UC4, A, B, and C, depending on severity of the environment. But um, just some examples, just to throw it out there, is you know, pedestals where you're like, close to ground contact can sometimes be considered a UC class four, and also these uh, planter boxes, because everybody loves plants, right? 
Um, the other, one of the documents that I found that actually had a really, uh, a fair amount of information pertaining to treated wood is the, uh, the AITC uh, 109 document. And uh, this was developed in 2007 by the American Institute of Timber Construction. And it offers really good guidance on uh, treatment of structural glue lamb, uh, anything above UC2 exposure. And it refers heavily to the uh, AWPA use class table, but it also prohibits the use of CCA creosote and penna for in interior use, which is probably a good idea. Um, so the National Design Standard, this is the 2018 version for the American Wood Council. Um, it has a chapter on CLT. Um, a lot of their specifications are assuming a moisture content of 16% or less, and then they have special correction factors uh, that apply to wet service um, when you get above 17%. It also refers heavily to the AWP standards for guidance, but um, actually, based on looking at this, I found the ASC 109 actually had more information. Uh, the CLT handbook also mentions durability frequently, um, but it doesn't really have a whole lot of specifics. Uh, it also talks about these wet process areas where preservatives may be used, but it doesn't really give you any guidance. And uh, also you're referencing the uh, AWPA use class too. Uh, the APA has recently released the North American Standard for Performance Rated CLT. Uh, this gives you a lot of uh, required test methods for quality assurance. Uh, a lot of it pertains to fire. There's really not a whole lot of, that pertains to decay and, fun, uh, decay and insects at all. Um, but again, it goes back to this 16% um, cutoff. Is like once you're above that number, you're you're in mold land. So you need to pay attention. Uh, the next part, I just want to kind of highlight the uh, four projects that we've got going on at FPL. Um, we had a industry meeting at the lab. It was a CLT workshop. I think it was about three years ago, and these were some of the the main topics that came out of our discussions there. And um, the first thing we want to talk about is fungal degradation. And this is being done with Mississippi State University. And the goal here is just really to broadly evaluate performance of CLT and resistance to fungal degradation, just to get some baseline numbers. We're also interested in evaluating the effects of de wood decay at the glue line. And we also want to develop some, or actually modify uh, existing laboratory test methods specifically for CLT. And when we set this up, I was writing this up and, you know, we've got the AWPA E10 soil bottle test that we use all the time. It's a really great screening tool and you can you know, you run a bunch of them and it gives you good uh, preliminary data. So we were just like, yeah, we'll just run some big ass E10 bottles and that's what we'll do. And it turned out it's a little more difficult than that when you start scaling up. Um, but these are some preliminary tests from, or preliminary results from these tests. Uh, we're using uh, two white rots, two brown rots, uh, Tremides versus Color, Gliophyllum travium, Postia placenta, and Urpe Urpex lacteus. Um, and those are kind of our standard fungi that we use for lab testing. Um, our first round of tests, we don't see a whole lot of mass loss. Um, but one issue that we're having with this test is because the large sample size, uh, we're, we're doing this in like a four liter cube now instead of our, our little bottle that we normally use. Uh, so there's a lot of surface area on the CLT that's um, subject to drying. So we're having a lot of trouble with moisture maintenance in the, uh, in the soil bottle itself. So that's impacting our results right now. And uh, Beth and the people at MSU are trying to work on round two of that right now. And also, um, we've gotten some mycelial growth, um, but again, because of the low moisture, we're just not where we want to be. Um, we're also doing some uh, soil condition testing to determine appropriate water capacity and forced air drying of CLT, like I mentioned before. And uh, upcoming, they have uh, a set of tests going in this spring and summer, um, changing that setup a little bit and uh, hopefully we'll have results for that next year. And these are just some images of kind of what the test setup looks like. Uh, these are big uh, food grade bins that are sterilized and they have soil and you have, those are feeder strips and then you also have access um, 
of the fungi to the actual CLT material showing some mycelial growth. But again, those tests are not where we want them to be at this point. Um, eventually, we want to get the whole thing all fuzzy and gross looking. <laughs> so our next test is termite resistance of CLT. Uh, this is Juliet Tang and other colleagues at uh, Mississippi State. Uh, we wanted to improve a, upon uh, existing test methods to properly um, as, assess uh, CLT for termite exposure. Um, we also want to understand where the termites are feeding in the CLT because on, on, a, on a structural basis that's important. And we're also doing some comparisons because when we were setting this up, we were, we understand solid lumber pretty well. And we were going back and trying to, you know, extrapolate and we don't really have a good handle on engineered lumber as a whole. So there, there's a lot of work to be done there. So we're hoping we can improve on that. Um, so the first part of this test is just uh, developing standardized termite tests for CLT. And uh, we had untreated CLT. We had a dug fur mix and SPF that was donated by Smart Lamb a couple years ago. They're little blocks. And uh, we took uh, mass loss data and also visual ratings. I'll show some results of that in a minute. And uh, the remaining test in 2008 is uh, we're changing up the test methodology right now because the normal, what we're following here is the uh, E1, which is a standardized termite test uh, for laboratory. And it specifies uh, 300 termites with a like five to one so, uh, soldier to worker ratio. I might've got that backwards. And um, that's specifically for like a, you know, a wafer that we use. So now we're like 10 times bigger. So we're having to adjust the number of termites that we introduce in the test also to get meaningful results. So still some modification going on there. But uh, this is just highlighting the three tests that we've done so far. Um, this is CLT exposed to reticulotermes. Uh, reticulotermes would be the native subterranean termites that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's actually like three or four subspecies within that, so. But uh, this kind of shows you some uh, feeding. And also, uh, we didn't get really good uh, correlation between feeding, like visual feeding damage on the surface. Mm -hmm. So um, Beth actually took these over to the vet school and they uh, did some uh, tomography using x-ray and that gives you a, a nice view mm -hmm. through the block. So if there's any interior feeding that you're not seeing on the outside of the block, you can pick it up really well with this. And this is, uh, again, the reticular termes, which we didn't have a whole lot of feeding there. So, um, and again, we're, we're in the process of kind of troubleshooting this to maybe see if we need more termites and maybe a longer test to accommodate the larger size of the specimen. The second test we did is with uh, Coptotermes formosanus, which is the uh, Formosan termite that's the introduced species that I mentioned earlier. And Mississippi State has a uh, Formosan research test facility in McNeil, Mississippi. So these tests were performed there. And um, we got a little bit more feeding uh, because Coptotermes typically forage in higher numbers. Mm -hmm. So you can actually get, you know, better response in, 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 this, in these tests. And uh, again, going back on visual surface wise, you don't see a whole lot, but if you go to the, uh, the x-ray images, you can see a lot of feeding actually right here, and, and this is pretty important right here that you see. Uh, the way termites feed a lot is they, they preferentially will excavate areas of different density. And you see, like right here by this glue line, they've taken a lot of the, uh, the early wood out of there. And, 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 you know, that's pretty significant. And uh, that's something we want to keep an eye out for more and, and see if, if that turns into a pattern. Because if, if they're, you know, cozying up to the glue line right there and causing damage, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. And that's also presents an opportunity to maybe introduce some, like, uh, insecticidal additions to the glue. And this is the comparative test where we're looking at different uh, types of engineered wood products just as a comparison. We've got LVL, um, PSL, and uh, we also did a treated uh, paralam, and just looking at uh, characteristic feeding between the uh, four different types of products. And uh, that test is still ongoing. Uh, the third project that I want to mention is the CLT coatings. 
Uh, this is for exterior applications. Uh, the goal here is to identify a range of coatings su suitable for prolonging performance and service while maintaining a natural appearance. Uh, we've got 38 different formulations that we've put together at this point, and they range through semi -tr uh, transparent, semi-transparent, paint, water-based, and solvent-based. Um, and these are the kind of the properties that we're going to look at, uh, viscosity, pH, solid content, uh, glass transition temperature, volatile content, uh, also analyzing chemical spectra with FTIR, uh, doing some water repellency, uh, I think contact angle is what we're using for that, and also uh, using some uh, differential scanning calorimetry. I thought this was kind of interesting. These are uh, coated specimens that were submerged for 190 hours um, in water and then allowed to equilibrate and they took moisture readings. And as you can see, they're all above 20%, um, which is, you know, you're in, you're in mold range again. So that, that's, that's problematic, but it also presents an opportunity for some cobicidal additions here. So future work on this project, uh, we want to look at some more at water repellency and water vapor permeability tests. Um, we're going to do contact angle measurements to look how much uh, beading is on the surface of these. And um, Mojgan is also working on developing some uh, chemo mimetic mo chemometric models to where we can kind of uh, pare down some of these 38 and kind of get locked into a final test group that we want to scale up for some field testing. And these will be uh, put on racks in, uh, and exposed in Mississippi and Wisconsin. So the fourth project that we have um, was it last year uh, we got some panels donated from DR Johnson and these are actually I think window and door cutouts that were sent to <coughs> us. Um, Jeff was a, a big help in getting this done and this is kind of our first stab at, at field testing of CLT. Um, we put these out in our field test sites at the uh, Harrison Experimental Forest, which is in Social Mississippi. Uh, it's a hazard zone five, which is considered severe by the AWPA hazard zone map. And um, we're looking at a couple of different things here. Uh, one, we want to look at some remedial treatments because, you know, CLT is already going out. So we need to wrap our heads around some remedial treatments that we can use in service. And we also are looking at some spray-on treatments at installation. Um, anything going out in the southeast, uh, termites are going to be a consideration. And uh, we wanted to try out some soldrants, termiticides, um, to see how that has an effect on the uh, termite feeding on the CLT. And, and basically, I'll show you in a minute how these are done. And then we've also got, uh, we've kind of modified the uh, AWPA E21 test to uh, simulate some severe above ground exposure. And uh, that's what these are. And it's basically a, a white box that's painted. So you get like no airflow in it and you just put that over the CLT. And so it just bakes in there. It's really high humidity, high heat, and it's a very severe test. You get tons of mold and hopefully we're gonna get some decay in there too. So they should be really awful when we pull them off, but we're not touching those for a year. Um, so this is kind of our experimental setup um, for the uh, termite tests. Um, so we're doing a, a bore care treatment at 23%. We've also got the uh, term Termidor, which is uh, Fipronil, as, as a soil drench at 0.125%. Uh, and then we've got the uh, remedial treatments we're doing with bore care at, at the one-year check and then controls. So experimental setup, we've got two uh, chunks of CLT per square. For the Termidor, all soil below the two CLT are treated. For the uh, preventative borate, one CLT treated, the other is left untreated as a comparison. And for the re uh, remedial treatment, uh, the two were untreated until the action point, which is at one year. And then we're going to treat one, leave the other untreated to see how the comparison works there. And we've got five replicates in this study, and it's going to be evaluated for five years. Um, and this is the E21 test I was talking about, and, wait, no, that's a repeat, sorry. Yeah, these are just some more pictures of the uh, spray-on preventive treatments. And these are those E21 covered specimens, right? that's what they look like now. 
and that's what they're going to look like for the next year. And then we'll start to tear all those off and see what kind of spiders and snakes and all kind of great stuff we got in there. <laughs> Uh, so for the last part, I just wanted to kind of touch on a couple of discussion points and what we kind of see as future research needs for this, so idea giveaway time, I guess. Um, the, one of the big things that we're trying to figure out with CLT is treatment process options. Um, because this is, you know, these things are already built and they're already made and the process is pretty well defined. And we don't really understand how to fully incorporate pressure treatment into this at all. So we're kind of looking at our options and, uh, you know, are looking for partners and ideas <laughs> if anybody wants to uh, yeah, give us a call. Um, so we also have more termite work to do. Uh, we want to do some more coptotermies um, work. We need field data for this because uh, laboratory testing is great, but it doesn't give you kind of the full picture. Um, we also need to look at dry wood termites um, because these are arboreal feeders and they get into dry wood. So moist wood is no longer an issue. Um, and uh, there's some, uh, we're looking at some field test sites either in uh, Georgia, I think Brian Forschler has a test site there and also UC Berkeley. Um, and Florida and Hawaii are kind of the two worst areas in, in the US and uh, those are two areas that we need to focus on because they've got a whole bunch of different termite species and uh, pretty much all of them. So that would be good to, uh, to do some more termite testing there. And we're also really interested in, in how to incorporate some termiticide integration into the pedestal of the CLT construction. Um, we definitely need to do a lot more decay fungi work. Um, I just kind of glossed over brown rot fungi, but there's really many different kinds of those. And there's a particular group in there that's the uh, cord formers, which uh, have been called uh, like dry rot fungi. And, and basically they form these thick walled hyphae that can translocate moisture. And so there doesn't need to be an actual moisture event for them to set up shop. So they can translocate moisture and some of the old uh, Serpula Lackerman's literature is showing that this can go for a couple of stories even. So you can get two-story translocation of moisture by, by, a, by a fungus. And uh, that seems to be problematic and could be a potential problem for CLT. Um, we're doing a, a fair amount of work at the lab with uh, copper tolerant fungi. And a lot of those uh, cord formers also um, exhibit a particular high Top, uh, copper tolerance. So, you know, ex more understanding of that would be great. Um, Co-biocides for coatings, as I showed with kind of the, the, uh, the, the moisture content of those mold uh, samples, uh, is something we definitely need to be thinking about. And uh, I'd like to get more involved in looking at glue line interactions as far as how fungi behave and interact with glue lines because we've kind of made them a new environment here that they may or may not be used to, but I, I think it's, it's very well worthwhile to uh, understand how they're gonna behave. And uh, for the white rot fungi, um, if you're talking uh, hardwood CLT, this would be a, a bigger concern there. But also a lot of your white rots um, are able to break down a lot of um, polycyclic aromatic compounds, which is a lot of your resins and things like that. So that's something to think about. And the uh, national design standard also specifies naturally durable wood. Um, I think I saw one of the companies was making an Alaskan yellow cedar product, which I, I was excited about. Um, but uh, naturally durable wood is kind of a tricky subject. Uh, we've been working on this for about four or five years, and uh, it's really variable. Um, and one of the things that we struggle with is uh, looking at QAQC for uh, durability. And a lot of this revolves around extractive content. So uh, I think we're going to continue doing some work in that area, and we'd love to be involved in some field testing of some naturally durable CLT. Um, and yeah, here's a shameless plug for some of our covered bridge work that we did a couple of years ago. Um, and that gets, kind of gets us to the unknown unknowns portion of the talk. I like, what don't we even know that we don't know at this point? And uh, you know, you've got a whole new construction style here, and and I think we need to. Wood preservation 
needs to take a, a hard look at this and kind of try to wrap our heads around what have we created here that, and, and, and where, do we need, where do we fit in? And there's just a couple of examples here of things that I, I think you know, are, are pretty important that we don't really fully understand and present some opportunity. So just some conclusions. Uh, fungi and termites pose a significant risk to untreated wood and above and ground contact, and this would include CLT um, because most of your CLT is made of, you know, moderately to non-durable wood species glued together. Um, the current design specifications allow for preserved and treated wood and naturally durable wood is also uh, allowed, but um, the technology really hasn't caught up yet. Um, and we're working with collaborators to study CLT durability in a wide variety of conditions. And also future work will address better treatment options and how to fully incorporate durability into CLT design. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, um, first off, our funding. Um, this was, two of these projects are funded by the U.S. Endowment for Forestry. Uh, two are funded off of the uh, USDA Green Building Project. Um, I'd also like to thank D.R. Johnson and Smartland for donating the test materials. Uh, I am greatly indebted to the co-authors on this. Uh, Katie, Mark, Juliet, and Beth both provided a lot of great information here. And uh, I'd like to thank Amy Bischel for correcting all my uh, formatting inconsistencies. <laughs> so yeah, that's the end of it. And it's just, yeah, so we're taking questions at the end, right? <laughs>